Good morning. Good to be back with you all again after a week's absence at National Conference. I certainly want to thank my son Van for filling in in my absence and uh, did, a, did a marvelous job. And Elder Dick Knapp, uh, who uh, took over my Sunday school class and uh, understand there was a lot of uh, sharing about Father's Day in the class, so praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> it's good to be back from National Conference and bring you greetings from some of the uh, pastors and wives that we have here on our prayer list. Again, uh, as we go down the prayer list, um, Carol Stuckey is uh, doing better. Um, America is still up there in South Haven. I uh, understand she's going to be there quite a while at that rehab center. She's in room 408, and um, it's not hard to find. Uh, if you want to go up to visit her, I will just tell you that you will have to wear a mask because of the COVID protocols that are still in place. Continue to pray for Brother John White and his wife Mitzi. Um, I also, uh, and uh, John's not home, but of course he's he needs uh, a lot of care, and there are people coming in to help out with that, but uh, it's still quite a, quite a strain on Mitzi, so really keep her in your prayers. Also remember her mother, um, Kay Panico, who is uh, go undergoing infusions now, I uh, understand every day, and uh, so Lord, uh, just pray that the Lord will continue to strengthen and enable her um, because she's working full time and still takes care of a lot of animals and so on. So continue to keep uh, Sister Kay in your prayers. Also continue to remember Joyce and Curtis Smith, uh, the Galaros and Brother DeRossi, and the pastors who are on the list. Talk to Pastor Jeff Eno and his wife, Pat. Uh, they were there at conference. Pat seems to be doing really well. And uh, Jeff is, was there. He was able to get around, but he has to be on oxygen. He's got a little portable oxygen unit, much like uh, Brother Danny Castro had when he was here before the Lord called him home. And uh, it enabled him to be in the services and to um, socialize and so on. Uh, I said, boy, Jeff, you're, you look like you've come a long way. He says, I have, but I still got a long way to go. He said, don't, don't give up, keep praying for me. Uh, our brother Chris Knight was also there and uh, seemed to be doing fine. But I asked him, I said, Chris, have, have they found out yet what's, what caused all these problems you've been having? He said, nope. He said, one doctor said I have uh, multiple sclerosis and uh, another doctor said I don't. So he's just taking it a day at a time. Uh, the effects, uh, he had some numbness and he lost his balance and fell a few times, but he, he didn't seem to have any problem there at conference and uh, took an active part, leading singing, playing the piano. And um, so it was good to see Brother Chris doing well. Did not get much of an update on Brother Mike Ostrander, but uh, he is, um, understand, I heard that he filled in last Sunday at Mishawaka for Brother Davy Troxel, so he must be doing well enough to do that. Uh, talked to Ruth Johnson uh, Saturday, and um, uh, she said Howard is doing better he is preaching, but he doesn't have much energy, strength. And uh, so continue to remember Brother Howard Bennett and his wife Linda. She fell. She's got some issues. And uh, continue to remember our dear brother Dick Harstein. I did touch base with Pastor Jim Rose, who's doing well. Asked him about his wife, Patty. And he said uh, they were going, they were waiting on surgery and they were hoping that she would be able to have surgery soon after he got back from conference. Well, conference ended Wednesday. I haven't heard anything, but pray that she will get the surgery that she needs for that growth 
in her abdomen. All right, I think that's all the prayer requests on our, in our bulletin. I wanted to make sure and update you on all those things. Also, a reminder, this evening at 6 o'clock, we will be having an evening service, but it is a, one of our special services. It's our quarterly threefold communion service. So we would encourage you uh, to be here for that. And anyone out there in, in internet land, if you would like to come and, and worship and fellowship with us at our communion service, you're more than welcome. The only requirement is that you be a born again believer. And I will tell you, we practice threefold communion. We practice feet washing, the love feast, and the Eucharist, all three, because that's what the Bible teaches. We make no apologies for that. All right, I think that's all of the announcements I need to make. I will uh, say this, um, July 4th is Independence Day. That's a week from Monday, tomorrow. And since that's 4th of July, we will have our elder board push back a week then. We will meet on the 11th. And then uh, a week, a little over a week, eight days past that, we will have our semi-annual business meeting July 19th at 7 p.m. here at the church. So please keep all these uh, important dates in mind and um, be there to support that. All right. Also, I put in your bulletins today a calendar for July. And if you look on that, uh, it's got uh, those things on there, the semi-annual business meeting. Then the following Sunday, on the 24th, my brother Eddie will be here, and he's going to preach, Lord willing. And um, we're going to have a, a Metzinger reunion uh, get-together here at the church following the morning service, we'll have a carry-in dinner and a fellowship time and anyone who wants to stay to be part of that, to spend time to talk with Eddie and Linda, my brother Wayne, and at least Wayne will be here, I'm not sure about his wife, my sister Judy and her husband Greg uh, Shai will be here. And uh, we're looking forward to several of the cousins and relatives and um, and while I was at conference, I talked to Brother Peter Peer, who pastors there at a, he has a church in his home there in, in uh, Dublin, and he said he would really like to be here, so he's planning on coming, so um, praise the Lord. That's going to be a red letter day, so keep that on your mind, uh, circle it on your calendars, uh, that's July 24th, next month. All right, I think that's all the highlight, uh, <laughs> highlights. All the announcements I need to highlight. So, before we get into the, the message this morning, let's have a brief word of prayer, shall we? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this beautiful Lord's Day. Truly, it is the day where the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I just pray now, Lord, that you would just quiet our hearts, anoint, anoint my lips, anoint our ears and hearts, hide me behind the cross, that as the message goes forth, it will go forth in the power and might of your Holy Spirit. Thus saith the Lord, we ask all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right. I will say we did have a delightful conference, wonderful conference. Some very challenging messages uh, from our moderator, Gordy Harmon, and then um, Brother Christopher Knight, challenged us, um, let me think now who all our, our speakers, um, and I did video all the, all the messages, I just don't have them all put on uh, DVDs yet, but I will do that. Um, man, my mind just went blank. Um, Brother yeah, Chris Knight and um, the last day, the last one was Dave Blevins, and um, Jonathan Edwards spoke, and uh, oh man, anyway, we had, we had some great, great challenges from some great men of God that, um, oh, Peter Peer, 
Peter Pierce spoke and he was, uh, he was to me one of the highlights of the week. He is, he is a tremendous uh, preacher. I'd like to have him come here sometime and share with us. Anyway, uh, I will be putting all those messages on DVDs and have them available if someone would like to use, uh, take, borrow one of them and uh, listen to them, you'd be welcome. Also, there, there are audio uh, CDs that will be available if someone wants to go that route. All right, I have a little story I want to share with you. You know, we're all getting older and uh, this kind of hits close to home but it's about this senior citizen who shared this. He says, I realized I had to use the bathroom. Got up, walked across the house to the pantry. When I got to the pantry, I couldn't remember why I was in the pantry. Then I remembered I had to use the bathroom. So, walked back across the house to the bathroom. While I was sitting on the throne, <laughs> I remembered why I went to the, bantry, to the pantry. I went there to get toilet paper. Apparently he was out. All right, please turn in your Bibles, turn in your swords to 1 John 2, 28. And uh, follow along as I read from my New American Standard Bible. I'm gonna read just this one verse. And uh, then we will, uh, as Pastor Russ Simpson, Dr. Simpson says, we'll unpack it a little bit. All right, 1 John 2, 28. John writes this, he says, Now little children, abide in him. Of course, that's Christ. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Very, very sound words there from the pen of the Apostle John. Now as he starts out, he says, Now little children. This phrase here alerts us to the fact that a transition is taking place in the Apostle's appeal. This new emphasis is that believers should live out the full potential of their status as the abiding ones to prove their relationship with the Father by the life they live. You know, they say the proof is in the pudding. And uh, as James wrote, he said, if you say I have faith and, and I have works, he says, I will show you my faith by my works. And he says, faith without works is dead. That's basically the same thing James is, or excuse me, John is saying here. So first of all, abiding in Christ begets confidence at his coming. I just read 1 John 2, 28. Now, many believers say the thought of the Lord's return in their lifetime gives them cause for great concern. In fact, some, it actually frightens them. And Pastor Dave Blevins, my, our dear brother who was here uh, a year, was it last fall? I think a year ago last fall. Uh, while we were at National Conference in his challenge he gave Tuesday evening, he said this. He shared how many believers, many Christians, when you ask them, they say, oh yes, I believe in the Lord's return. But he said they live their lives like he is never coming back. It's, they're just giving lip service. Do you believe in the uh, Lord's coming back? Oh, yeah. But they don't really believe it in their hearts, or their, their lifestyles would change. Now, John the Apostle, who is called the Apostle of Love, gives the secret of greeting Christ without overwhelming fear and shame. Let's examine his secret, the secret that he shares with us. Number one, the appeal for abiding in him. Verse 28, he says, Now little children abide in him. And it is evident from the context that the him there, of course, refers to our Lord, Jesus Christ. For who else can fit the words that follow 
so that when he appears, no one else can fit that. That wouldn't make any sense if it was, any, was anybody but our Lord himself. The mean, secondly, the meaning of abiding in him, this has been previously explained. In connection with chapter 2, verse 6, when John wrote this, he said, The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he, that is our Lord, walked. Saying the same thing as James said. Abiding in him is expressed by sharing with him in three areas. His thoughts, his words, and his actions. Now, listen carefully. One is not abiding when strolling into places of entertainment, dishonoring to our Lord, or engaging in talk that the Word of God condemns, or being involved in behavior that he would disdain, that he would reprove, rebuke. In brief, abiding is obeying his words. He said, if you love me, what? You will keep my commandments. You can't say you love the Lord and then live like the devil. Pastor Dave Blevins in his message said, you know, so many Christians are trying to keep one foot in the church and one foot in the world. He said, that doesn't work. You can't do that. James made that very clearly. You have to, uh, you know, you can't, you can't serve God and love money. You can't love the world. And J John wrote, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. And you don't have the Son. So pretty, pretty powerful words there. Number three, the reason for abiding in him. Now, I believe the intensity of our relationship with Christ measures the depth of our desire to please him. If for some cause we should be found walking out of fellowship with him at his coming, I'm talking about the rapture of the church, the shame which would overcome us, I don't know if you could measure it, it would be boundless. You know, our late brother pastor, Pastor Art McCrum, used to say, and he said it several times, he says, what would you feel? How would you answer our Lord if when he comes, you were in the midst of committing some awful sin, some act, maybe, a, not, maybe not adultery, but maybe watching por pornography or engaged in something that was obviously uh, that desperate sin, and if, he, if we were doing that at the rapture when Christ took us home, how would we answer a holy and righteous God for our actions? We couldn't, we just have to hang our heads in shame, and we'd be one of them that Paul wrote about that we, you know, we made it by the skin of our teeth. So talking about this, John wrote this in verse 28, he said, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. First, he will appear to us and our joy, our rapture, when we see him will be beyond description. We shall suddenly be completely transformed into his likeness. Our bodies will be, in a split second, go from this mortal, fallen, sin-susceptible body and mind that we have, and we will be transformed into His likeness, a glorified body, a glorified mind. Sin will never again be able to touch us. What has been going on slowly since we've been saved, as we've been little by little becoming more like him, it will just all, all of a sudden, it's done, it's completed. Isn't that tremendous? In 1 John 3, 3, he said, 
and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Paul in 2 Corinthians 3.18 said, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. What a glorious day that's going to be. Praise God. At the end of his uh, writings, uh, uh, one of them, uh, he said, Even so, come Lord Jesus. I believe that was uh, the Apostle John in the Revelation. Secondly, when shall we shall then appear before him at his judgment seat, the Bema seat of Christ, for an examination and evaluation of our works as members of the body of Christ. Paul again in 2 Corinthians 5.10 very pointedly said this, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And then John writes this, he says, for any works of abiding quality, we shall receive a fitting reward. And Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians, and he said, for if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. I think the older translation says by fire. And the NASB tells it as through fire. When I took Greek with Dr. Uh, Kevin Zuber, uh, I found out that, that uh, we went through that parsing the Greek verbs and all that, and it, it, it's a, the image that it, it puts there is, is better, it's a better image. Now the Greek text there gives the image of one coming out of a burning building with his coattails on fire. In other words, saved by the skin of his teeth. Paul says he will be saved, yet so as by fire. He's not going to lose his salvation, but he will lose his rewards. And uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's cutting it pretty close, folks, coming out of a burning building and just making it at the last split second while your coattails are on fire. That's what the Greek is, uh, is intimating in that, in that verse. Now also let it be remembered that the judge before whom all of these little children will stand in that day is none other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For all judgment has been committed to him, the Son. In his Gospel, chapter 5, verses 22 and 27, John wrote this, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, and he gave him authority to execute judgment. Why? Because he is the Son of Man, the Son of God. Wow. What a sobering experience that will be, especially if we have not been abiding. We will feel no confidence in that case only a sense of shame. When I stand before my, before my Lord at that famous seat judgment, I'm going to echo the words of Brother Dave Blevins and every one of the speakers at our conference. He said, when we stand before our Lord to be judged for the lives that we have lived here on earth, he said, we want to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I don't want to be one of them that come, that got there running out of the building with my coattails on fire and just make it by the skin of my teeth. That's, uh, 
I mean, that's better than the alternative, going to the lake of fire, but what a sense of shame and remorse that a whole life spent for the Lord was wasted, that we, didn't, we were not faithful, not abiding, and therefore we lose our rewards. You know, while I was at conference, Dr. John Whitcomb's son, Dr. Dave Whitcomb was there, and he just finished volume one of a work on his father, and it's called A Good and Faithful Servant, The Life and Times of Professor John C. Whitcomb, Jr. And uh, I, boy, I was so happy to get that book and, and, and Dr. Whitcomb, Dr. Dave Whitcomb signed it for me and wrote a little uh, thing of encouragement there. And I sat down and it's, it's a big book. And I read the first seven chapters in just a couple of days. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't gotten back to it since conference, but I intend to finish that. It's, it's so encouraging to a believer to see how God used a man like Dr. John Whitcomb, who at one time was an evolutionist. And when he went to Princeton University, he met a man there named Donald Fullerton, who showed him the truth of the gospel, turned his life around, and he became a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. And uh, within the next year or so, World War II, he got, he got uh, drafted, he had to go serve in the army, and he served in Germany during that horrible battle, the Battle of the Bulge. Many of his uh, friends, comrades in arms, died in that battle. And Dr. Whitcomb was spared almost miraculously I remember him so tenderly sharing that with me at conference uh, a few years back. And he said, Brother Mensinger, he said, I had just come off of guard duty. He, and I knew what that was like. I, I was in the army and I had guard duty. He said, my shift had just ended. I just got back behind this protective wall and uh, he said, I no sooner got back there and a shell landed right where I had been standing. He said, 10 seconds sooner, I would have been blown into eternity. And it hit him right then and there that God had a great plan for his life. He had just spared his life. And boy, did he ever. When he finished his tour in the army, when he was discharged, he went back, got his degree at Princeton University. Then he entered Grace Seminary. And he and a couple of his uh, buddies from, from uh, Princeton, one of them was uh, John Ray. And they both became later professors at Grace Seminary. And uh, boy, it's just, a, it's just an exciting book as it details the life of Dr. Whitcomb. And a lot of these things I already knew. I met him when I was about eight or nine years old. And he shared with me the truths of his doctoral thesis, The Genesis Flood, which later they used as a basis for the book that he and Dr. Henry Morris co-authored called The Genesis Flood. And the effect that it had on Christian thinking about creation and evolution and all this stuff, it just transformed that. Transformed that. So anyway, putting in a little plug here for Dr. Whitcomb's uh, the book on his life, and uh, it's well worth reading, very encouraging, and uh, very informative. So anyway, it's been great uh, sharing with you, and um, next week, Lord willing, we will continue in this study in 1 John, and we're going to look at how walking in righteousness confirms the new birth. That'll be 1 John 2, 29. So, this is Pastor Bob Mensinger then saying goodbye for this week. It's been great to be back with you again after a week's absence. And uh, as we go through this week, may the Lord uh, encourage and exhort all of us, keep encouraging and exhorting one another 
and so much the more as we see the day approaching. And as I talked to Brother Mike Wingfield there, uh, someone asked him, said, we'll see you next year at conference. And he says, I don't think we're going to be here next year. He thinks the Lord is going to return before then. He might be right. We don't know. But anyway, he said, you know, the Lord told us, occupy till I come. So we're not going to sit on our thumbs. We're going to continue to preach and teach the word and try to win souls of men and women and boys and girls for Christ. And when that last soul is saved and the bride of Christ is full, the Father will tell the Son, go, and he will come and take us out of this world to be with himself. All right, so this is goodbye for now. And uh, like I said, Lord willing, we will, we will be with you again next week, same time, same station. In the meantime, God bless you and continue to encourage and exhort one another. Goodbye.